This is the Tri-City Herald edit board with um, Matt Benke and Larry Stanley for uh, Legislative District 8 state rep position. And um, I'm gonna introduce all of us and then uh, we'll let um, Matt and Larry have their two minute opening remarks and then we'll just go from there. And so I'm Cecilia Rexis and I'm the editorial writer with the Tri-City Herald. And we have Ken Robertson. He is a retired uh, executive editor with the Tri-City Herald and Jack Briggs, retired publisher with the Tri-City Herald. We have Lori Williams. She's the current executive editor of the Herald and Martine Valadez is our community rep. And so, um, so that's us. So um, I think we usually let the incumbent go first. <laughs> so we'll just stick to that, that tradition. He can break the ice. So he's been through this before. So Matt, I'm gonna let you have your two minute opening and then Larry, I'll let you have that. So whenever well, you're ready to roll. It. Okay, I can uh, jump right in, but I appreciate you guys having us today with the Tri-City Herald and for hosting this event. It does mean a lot because I know what you guys are going through. You know my name, Matt Binky. I'm the Republican candidate for the 8th Legislative District, position two. And I'm here to really get your endorsement on who the best candidate is and have these discussions with critical issues that are impacting us. A local kid that grew up in the Tri-Cities, Kennewick School District and graduate of Eastern Washington University. Of course, went on after graduation to serve in the military for 21 years, retiring as a uh, cyber expert as a Lieutenant Colonel over those times. My wife of over 30 years allowed me to retire back here in the Tri-City area to help raise our kids and immediately went to work for the Corps of Engineers as well as Energy Northwest and then settled in my position as a professor. So I'm really honored to support Columbia Basin College. Our highest priority, I think we're gonna discuss more of this, but is the fiscal health of the eighth legislative district in the time of COVID and really how we reopen our society as safely as we possibly can. Uh, when elected, I pledge to still listen to the citizens. I believe we need to do that more and build bridges with our local business leaders, our individuals, our families, and those people that are hurting during this time. I and I am uh, running for uh, uh, the same position, legislature, uh, no, um, district uh, eight, uh, position two. And um, uh, I'm running under the banner of the Alliance Party, which is a relatively new party, only a couple years old. Um, it's kind of a, uh, a merging of uh, couple, uh, oh, a little, almost a dozen centrist minor parties um, that are trying to make a go of it um, and uh, uh, give the American people uh, an option. And so really I saw um, that the Democrats were not gonna put up anybody against Matt. And I decided uh, the, uh, our, our uh, citizens here, our voters needed a, a choice. Democracy needs a choice. So. Uh, I jumped in. Um, I did try to uh, run uh, last year and uh, for Richland City Council. So um, I'm not completely um, uh, a, a duck out of water, but uh, I uh, um, am uh, 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 jumping in because uh, I, I, I want to see our community thrive, even in the midst of uh, the, the dire times we, we do live in. Um, I want to see a strong recovery. And um, I graduated from Hanford High School, uh, gr grew up in Richland most of my life, um, and uh, spent uh, uh, a lot of my adult life in California and uh, international teaching. As um, I also started a business in Colorado um, and I uh, um, have uh, been a minister uh, down in uh, uh, California as well as up here. So uh, currently I am a manager of a tasting room in, uh, for a winery on Red Mountain. So um, uh, everybody knows the awesome wine that we have up there. Um, so uh, I'm, I'm in touch with not only small businesses, but also 
uh, the needs of our agriculture as well. Um, okay. We are a very diverse uh, area um, and uh, I wanna see us uh, diversify even more um, in our economy. Um, I, education is high uh, as well on my list. Um, and so uh, uh, whenever possible, um, we, should, uh, we should improve and, uh, and uh, increase funding if necessary. Um, and uh, I am also one to uh, uh, not get stuck in the uh, pigeonholes of the, of the two parties. Um, when it comes to budgets, budget deficits, um, I believe you can do a little bit of raising taxes and you can do a little bit of cutting. You don't have to be one side or the other. I'm going to stop you there. I think you're yeah. over your, <laughs> okay. your two minutes. That's, that's perfect though. That's a good, that's a good segue because we'll jump back to Matt. He was saying his big priority is the fiscal health of the uh, region. So then we will let him talk about that and elaborate, and then maybe you can, um, uh, share your ideas on, on okay. how we can recover from COVID. So go ahead, Matt, I'm gonna let you touch on that. Sure, I think a big piece is uh, the impact of COVID. Uh, the last two sessions we went into, the majority party went ahead and uh, decided against our wishes and we actually had a surplus. Uh, one year we had 6.2, I believe, and then the next year we had almost $4 million that we could have allocated into our surplus for a rainy day into our contingency fund. And now is when the time we needed those funds to go ahead and, and support our local industries or support our economy and get people back to work. And that fund is not there. And so what we're looking at doing is, is leveraging the opportunities where we can see the benefit of budget allocations of understanding we have a spend problem in our state and look at the different priorities we can to get people reopened as safely as we possibly can to get people back to work. Uh, if you reach out in the local economy, the local industries that we see here, we're kind of in a bubble like we were in 2008 because of our support with our federal government and the things going on at Department of Energy, as well as Pacific Northwest National Labs. Uh, so that's helped us a little bit more than the rest of the state. But if you look at the agricultural community, and there was a big impact on that as well as through, and it currently is, it's going to take us three or four years to get back to what the normal uh, numbers were, and as well as what we've seen the reports coming out of the transportation of what Boeing's doing to our state is gonna be a big economic impact to what our businesses are throughout the state. So some of those are the priorities that I think we can leverage on and we can expand on in our, our local community and look forward as leaderships that we can do in the next couple of years. Okay, Larry, your turn. What do you think about trying to recover from, from COVID? Well, it is gonna, an all hands on deck situation. We need help from from everybody. It would be nice if we received a little help to our state budget from uh, from the uh, federal government. But uh, as of now, that uh, we're going to have to go on our own. It seems like um, I agree with Matt that the the uh, money for a rainy day fund should have stayed for a rainy day, which we are currently in. Um, uh, they should have found whatever funding they pulled that uh, for should have been uh, found somewhere else. But um, uh, I believe that uh, you know we we are faring much better in this district than uh, much of the rest of the, the state. But uh, um, Matt is right that the ag really got hit hard, um, especially the food processors. Um, uh, all up and down that line. And uh, I know uh, uh, wineries are, are, are not buying uh, the, the grapes. The, uh, the, the uh, 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 farmers are not uh, being able to sell their fruit. So there is uh, uh, great angst in that area. Um, it is gonna take a while to recover. It's not gonna be a one cycle thing. It's probably gonna take a couple of years, uh, no matter what we do. So, um, um, but, but they, they do need some help. And Larry, so, you had said yeah. something earlier in your opening about maybe raise a little bit of tax and cut a little bit. So what, do you have any ideas uh, as far as taxes, which taxes you would be okay with? Um, um, 
You know, I, I don't want to raise taxes if at all possible, but in a situation like this, we may have to. Mm -hmm. um, as far as, uh, you know, obviously anybody, any business and any person that's in the lower 80 percentile um, really can't afford that. Um, so we're going to have to find ways of, of um, extracting that from the upper percentile, and that's really hard to do. So... Um, We'll, we'll, you know, I, I'm not 100% sure how that could happen. I mean, there's a couple of ideas out that are floating out there, but uh, there's also problems attached to them. So, uh, you know, some of the uh, the the left would would mention like a wealth tax or or something else like that, or or maybe a carbon tax, or you know, that there's tied to our uh, environmental situation, but. Uh, um, there are issues with each one of those, and so we'll, we'll have to we'll have to vet each each possibility. Um, I, I'm a, I, you know, I am a newbie, so I'm gonna have to listen to the experts and our constituents. Okay. Are there any other questions from the board? Yeah, I uh, since we're talking about COVID, uh, I'd like to hear uh, both of you. Uh, uh, rate the governor and uh, give me an explanation for uh, your comment on how you rate the governor on COVID-19. Go ahead, Matt. You can start. Yeah. Okay. I was going to say who goes first. Yeah, um, go ahead. Go I ahead. first class and to be clear, I'm, I'm not for any of those taxes that Larry talked about. I think we can get out of this with actually giving some support back to the businesses. And actually my piece would be uh, if we could leverage some kind of uh, allowable to the payroll tax that's going on, give some relief there and extend some of that out to allow businesses to come back, maybe a little extra boost to do that. As far as the governor onto that question, I would rate him initially probably a seven or eight when it first started in March. Really good job of communicating with us. We were still at the state and the session was going on. Gave us opportunities to discuss with the experts on the plan that was moving forward. I start dropping that down almost with, uh, uh, you could see the stock market when it was dropping into April with the support because uh, the initial discussions with our committees and our chairs and even uh, uh, the House of Representatives, we were blocked out of some of those discussions as we moved into March and April. And when we tried to work with other agencies to do bipartisan efforts of reopening the Home Builders Association to get other federal monies to come in, to work in collaboration with across the aisle partnerships, we were blocked out of some of those staff meetings to the point of when the initial uh, impact of the cyber hack on the unemployment insurance agency went, I was the first person to step up to the plate and ask her, what are we doing about this as a cyber expert in our community? I want to know what's going on. And the next day, I got a letter in the mail from unemployment agency that says I owed them $3,000 back to the state when I was given supposedly that money. So as the more and more I saw that and the more my phone rang about local constituents that were being impacted by this, the, the businesses that were being done. Remember, we were 14 days. We we're going to get through this. We we're going to flatten the curve and then move back up. The communication seemed to falter. The metrics came out with the... Uh, some of the parts of the state that weren't as good. Now, after May, we started doing a little bit better. And I believe even locally and regionally, we gathered forces. And I think to our credit, we had elected leaders uh, meetings. We had telecons. We had uh, Zoom meetings. And we brought people together. And I think that's where we could have done a lot better job of some of the lessons we've learned over this, uh, especially when it came to making sure our hospitals were taken care of, make sure we had the right number of PPEs, and even the extent of having to respond to an outbreak down at the Tyson food plant and even over at the uh, um, Lamb Weston uh, site as well. And we took care of those. We rallied the forces and we took care of business and we did a really good job. But I'd give them probably about a five or six after that initial seven. And that's why. Is that on a scale of one to 100 or one to 10? Uh, that's a great question. Um, <laughs> one to 10, Zach. One to 10. <laughs> Okay. All right. All right. Well, I would be a slightly more favorable to at the beginning. Uh, I think uh, the great thing about the uh, the governor's uh, 
uh, rollout was no matter how um, how little information we had in general about the uh, uh, about COVID and uh, and how to how to combat it, um, he was at least listening to the science and the experts and. Um, and I'd say uh, I'd give, from one to ten, I'd give him a nine. Um, he rolled out really well the first couple of weeks. Yes, it dragged on. Yes, after the initial curve got a little flattened, um, there was still, you know, too much going on um, as far as activity with the virus. So um, I, uh, it, it made it very difficult for small businesses. Um, you know, I give. You know, it, I would say it dropped a little bit, but but uh, part of the problem too is there was a lot of partisan um, eruptions that happened from the opposition party that uh, not only made it more difficult on the governor <clears throat> to rally the people, um, but also uh, made the spread uh, that much uh, greater uh, thanks to the anti anti-maskers, I should say. So, um, and that was that was a problem. I know that wasn't only local opposition party, but still um, they went along with it in general. I, I gotta say to Matt's credit, he was not that vocal in that regard, um, but um, um, the, that's, that was that was a problem. So Matt, back to you. Um, Larry just brought up an interesting point. There's, there's, <clears throat> there is a some real far right conservatives emerging in our community right now. Where, where do you find yourself in that mix? Are you well? Oh, I'll go ahead. Go going. ahead. I'm sorry. No, no. Oh, I was okay. just asking where you where do you see yourself? Because like like Larry said, there were the anti-maskers that they wanted to defy the governor. Where what were your thoughts? Well, I guess I would take a line from the Tri City Herald and newspaper reporters around the globe that if I'm doing my job right, I'm getting feedback from both sides. And whether that's positive or negative feedback, then I think I'm doing my job on both fronts. That I'm getting pulled on one side to the other and saying. I'm not doing too much or I'm not doing enough to support us and get back to what I should be doing and I should be doing more of this. And you guys know that better than anybody that if you're right there in the middle and you try to pull people together, to me, this is the tapping into the experience as a military officer that I've trained over so many years to I think build bridges and bring out more of the glasses half full. And I've always been a positive outlook kind of person that no matter what state we're in or no matter what situation we're at, uh, you can always reach out to our neighbors in our community, the community that helped raise me, the community that helped raise a lot of people that have attracted so many more people to our community that makes us a great environment. I believe <clears throat> in the heart and soul of the Tri-Cities is that volunteerism that can pull us back together and that so many people, um, I believe truly as a cyber person, need to get off the internet, uh, need to get off social media. I uh, have been speaking up about this uh, discussion of so, uh, Social Dilemma movie that's on Netflix even. I posted on Friday, had a couple of group discussions about even when you have leaders in the big tech community that are saying they're getting scared of the way the tech is going and how far it's going and it's not being regulated enough, then that shows me that we need to do more in our state and our nation about what we can do to regulate and support people's privacy data especially when it's under 18. And our, we have more devices in our kids' hands that are at three, four-year-olds. And now that we move everybody online, everybody from K through 12, even pre-K now are online. And what does that mean to our society? What are we doing now that's gonna affect our kids in this next generation for years? So uh, to the extent I'm one of those who trying to bring people back together to showcase where you can go to get the truth. And I believe we're now in a battle in our society of where do you find that truth and that we can then discuss those in a civil manner and be professional about it to build bridges instead of tearing us apart. So are you in favor of wearing masks? Were you on board with that or were you um, opposing that? 
in, yeah, the, in I was, the beginning. Uh, oh, in the beginning. I was one of those actually in the Visit Tri-Cities that was standing up there with Senator Brown and we were holding signs and we were supporting the team. I was near the video with uh, General Mattis of doing that. Oh, okay. I, and that's why I mean, as nice as I could say, I got a lot of flack from the right. I got a lot of flack from the left. It just seems like I feel like I was doing my job when both sides were telling me, hey, what are you doing? You're not okay. being a Republican enough. You're not being enough of a Democrat. I don't know. It was just confusing <laughs> okay. time for everybody. But, it sounds uh, like yeah. you were in the newspaper business. I, I think so. <laughs> I, I can feel some of your pain there, Jack. So. Yeah. Okay. So um, I'm interested in the Alliance Party, Larry, if you could expound yes. on that a little bit. Is that, um, how many, I mean, how big is it? You made it sound like it's very new. Is this, is this your creation or am I? No, it, it, it is not my creation. Okay. I actually uh, was the national chair of the modern Whig Party. Now everybody's eyes can roll. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> um and there was, uh, um, like I said, almost a dozen other um, minor centrist parties out there all trying to do something on their own and okay. not spinning their wheels. And um, we had a kind of a center right group in out of Vancouver um, um, in Washington. And the actually, they were very small in Washington, but in other other states, there's a lot larger groups and they've started talking and um, and trying to bring some of these state groups together. Like there, there was a large uh, party, uh, centrist party. Um, uh, I think it's just called the American party of South Carolina that merged in that, 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 that uh, was growing. Well, um, the independence party of, um, of well, not the, the independent party of Minnesota, which, gave rise, you know, came out of the reformed and gave rise to Jesse Ventura over there. Um, they've been very active. Um, so what's your platform? What's, what does the Alliance our platform, Party stand for? Our platform for? Is, is, is focused mainly on transparency um, <clears throat> and election reform, um, getting, uh, uh, tra transforming the elec electoral process, uh, to, to be more representative, um, also uh, uh, to you know to to regulate uh, money in the um, um, in, in the uh, fund you know campaign fundraising um, to uh, uh, change um, you know to to give other another option really to, okay. to people. Um, and since the two main parties seem to be, at least to the, the eyes and ears of, of the majority of the population, seem to be getting farther and farther away from the center, um, this uh, group kind of decided they, they, they wanted to be that center option. And um, so I would say, you know, we kind of were brought together by center right group. In the end, I think we ended up being a little bit more center left. But, uh, and, and myself, I'm a lot more progressive than the majority of our party. Um, so uh, if you look at my issues uh, and my, my plans, uh, they do tend to lean a lot more left than, uh, than some of the others. But uh, we also want to kind of bust that uh, right-left um, uh, dichotomy because we want to be solutions oriented. And sometimes that's, that needs to be out of the box. That means it needs to be off that continuum. Okay. Larry, I was surprised. I looked at your webpage and locally it says that you've got 15 members. You've had two meetings. One was attended by one and the other was attended by two. So I was staggered when you got 7,500 votes. Um, you, must, you must have a, a real perseverance uh, sort of a, a trend to you. How are you gonna catch up with Matt? You know, um, you know, I got, you know, I admit it's, 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 it's going to take a miracle, but <laughs> I, uh, I have a handful of, of volunteers. I have a very small budget. The, uh, the national party actually gave me, uh, $1,200 to, uh, to spend. Uh, and I've, I've raised another, uh, you know, almost, uh, $1,800, um, so I've got a little bit of money. I'm preparing my one mailer 
uh, to go out to a small group of, uh, of potentially Democrats in, in Richland. Um, <laughs> I'm focusing in on them. I've got, got uh, door hangers going out. I've got a few signs. I've got to put up the rest of my signs. Um, so I, I, I notice uh, Matt hasn't put up uh, hardly any signs yet. And that's, I understand that. <laughs> but um, um, it's, uh, you know, there's, we're, we're, we're working it. I, I've got a full-time day job, which makes it very difficult to, uh, to, to do something like this. And um, my, my hope is that there's just uh, enough people that have, are fed up with the other two parties. So can I ask a question? Yeah. Uh, I'm, Cecilia, is that okay? Oh, of course. Yeah, jump in, jump in. So, I mean, you know, so obviously, you know, a lot of what we, we we're focused on and, and rightly so is the COVID, you know, all the, the economy, just the politics around it. So the question for both of you, sort of if you look beyond COVID and, and think about, you know, you know, if we weren't in this situation, what what is it that not only Washington State but the Tri Cities? What is the biggest challenge outside of COVID that you see that we should be focused on? Why don't we let Matt, uh, Matt start? Matt, oh yeah, yeah, because he. Do you want me to go? Uh, sure. Well, to answer uh, real quick, answer Larry. I got signs out. I don't put them in. So my strategy is I put them in people's front yards. So that means to me that that guarantees that they understand me, they support me in 100%. So they're out there, but they're strategically located. Um, the biggest one for me besides COVID would be the, really the economic um, parallels that we're looking at as we clean up Hanford. What is that next generation we're gonna see in our local community that's gonna drive the economy, our education and the welfare of our, our, our side of the state. And I'm looking at position us to be strategic partners on supporting not only the Port of Tacoma, Port of Seattle, but we have a multimodal operations that we can work with the different ports of Benton, Pasco, and uh, Kennewick, and how we can leverage these different regional efforts to the federal level to showcase uh, a couple of the bills that I ran this year it was not only with the space industry, but also pivoting where we can see in the next generation of small modular reactors and what's going on at Pacific Northwest National Labs. One of the big things I ran on and was really proud of is supporting a lot of funding to come down to Pacific Northwest National Lab on the energy side of the battery development. So we can centralize battery operations for advanced automated uh, vehicles, autonomous vehicles, as well as autonomous uh, trucks that will be helping not only our carbon footprint, but also our economy as well to bring more jobs here. We're looking at training forces of not only the military coming down, we have uh, workforce development with that, as well as looking at the de development of the technology industry of the future. And some of those jobs now are being created by our next generation college students that are coming up through K through 12, hitting our colleges right now. And they're looking at that diversity of the economy that we can see from the capabilities of frankly, in a positive way that COVID has shown us. We have a grid that we need to make sure we're reliable. We need to make sure we can get internet to everybody. Rural broadband is a big issue I think we need to focus on and making sure that everybody has a capability of that like they do of clean water or a roof over their head or food on the table. Because that I think uh, allows all ships to rise when the seas take off. And then we can showcase that you don't need the west side or Seattle to be that much uh, of a key structure in the state's economy and continue to work with our ag community on how we can then prioritize that to get to them to market as, as fast as possible we can. So that's where I would see it the next generation. A couple of those there. Thanks. All right, Larry. All right, to f first off, to um, piggyback a little bit on Matt, I, I, uh, um, I'm right there with him in regards to the vision of our opportunities, our economic opportunities for the future. Um, much more in tech and all of that. Uh, but um, as far as two issues that I would have, uh, that I see as big hurdles for us in the future after COVID um, would be um, climate change. It's affecting ag and, uh, and uh, our uh, river and dams and uh, trees and so forth. Um, and then also our, um, our uh, housing situation 
uh, the housing market is extremely tight, driving up, uh, driving up uh, prices, and um, uh, there's, so affordable, affordable housing would be the other, the other situation. Um, as far as uh, climate change goes, uh, we need a global effort, so it's going to be uh, difficult for our little community uh, to do much, but we should do our part. Um, and I, I could go through some of those uh, possibilities, but um, you know, mo most of those things have already been outlined by the by uh, uh, the the, uh, the the advocates and, and scientists. But um, as far as housing goes, we need to um, uh, find ways to get developers to um, uh, to. We, we need to uh, find ways of encouraging them to build for uh, lower cost housing. And um, I know the, the profit margin is for the higher end, but, uh, but uh, the, we have a large part of our population that's being priced out of, of, of their apartments and houses, so. Okay. Those are the two areas. Matt, one of the problems that has often faced Patel is that it has a lot of output and ideas and everything else, but not too many of them manage to stay here in the Tri-Cities. Uh, yes. Money is one of the problems, the, you know, venture capital. But do you have any ideas on how you can help locate the output from those labs here and help the Tri-City economy? Larry, you want to take that first, or you want to? Um, I can actually. I think you have, uh, Matt. You have one of the uh, better ideas out there with the with the space <laughs> academy. Well, and that's what I was going to say, Jack. I think you're seeing a microcosm of what's going on in the state and how we wrestle with Boeing uh, and keeping them here. It's one thing of giving a tax incentive to a corporate corporation, and then they take the jobs and they run. It's another thing to develop and leverage all of our research and opportunities that PNNL has been doing for so many years. They've been pivoting from the nuclear industry to other parts of biology, physics, and then even our fisheries and hatcheries and our waterways. And what we need to do is work on that area to where we can support and sustain those here locally. What I've asked and worked with uh, Dr. Ashby and the group is to ensure if that money is then coming to us and earmarked here, it has to stay in the state and we can put those sideboards on there to ensure those uh, companies are working within our state and then they can give back to the community. One of the things we do as an option or as an example is the internship programs we see at Columbia Basin College at WSU Tri-Cities is developing those job opportunities locally that you can get entry level positions, whether it's in tech or in science fields or even engineering. And right now is leveraging uh, what Larry was mentioning. Some of the opportunities going into the Space Force was not just the initial program of working with SpaceX or Blue Origin and some of these others. It's the secondary market that they are lacking in of the manufacturing of that next generation satellite equipment. That same equipment is similar to what people are seeing on the next Tesla, the new cars, the new trucks that are gonna be out there. And as we are logistically centered for a multimodal operation, I believe if you pivot a lot of those ideas into that next gen, whether it's batteries, whether it's that fuselage, we can then help create an opportunities that will stay in the state, but not only that will attract others to our state, because now people in the words of Dr. Ashby was, they're gonna see us as the capital or the center of the universe when it comes to battery storage. Our experts will be here. We're gonna give classes on this. We're gonna generate that momentum that people are gonna see us as leading the industry. And I wanna correct Larry a little bit was that we already are 96% uh, carbon free. And we're leading the nation on that. And our big push is to ensure that we see the safety within nuclear power with the small modular reactors that we can then leverage and utilize those in our community. And we saw some great news this last week, I believe in the state of Utah, they have uh, cities lined up to go ahead and look at some of these small modulars and the National Regulatory uh, Commission are allowing them to move forward with some of those plans as well. But Larry, your turn. <laughs> well, Matt, actually, I, I did um, I did know we are quite a ways along the way there for energy, um, that we're much greener energy than most communities. Uh, so I, I, I'm, I'm there with you on that. But <clears throat> there's always things we can do. Um, and uh, um, 
the uh, uh, well is <clears throat> you know there's the the effects. What I was addressing was more of the effects of climate change, uh, because no matter what we do to become greener, um, the effects from the rest of the climate is is, is going to happen. And uh, while we are in our in the models I have seen, <clears throat> there's uh, we have uh, uh, a little bit of a protective bubble um, for for our agriculture for at least a decade or two. Um, but eventually it's going to catch up with us. So um, there are going to be issues with, with lots of our, uh, uh, our fruit, our, our, uh, even our grain, everything is going to be shifting. We're going to have to, we're going to have to grow different things. We're going to have to, um, or, or adjust the way we, the way we grow things. Um, there's also, um, and that's going to, that's going to shift what kind of food we process um there's um um you know tech uh, what, what what matt was talking about was uh trying to to bring to raise our our profile up to venture capitalists in the, uh into um an education um semi valley i'm not semi valley uh, silicon valley so uh, a mini version of that and i think it's very possible um, so I'm with Matt on that, and I I'm, I'm, uh, really think we have a lot of potential to bring the, keep the, a lot of those ideas that Battelle, Battelle uh, brings. Uh, my mom actually worked at uh, Battelle for most of her career and retired there, so uh, I'm, I'm very familiar with, with that. Now she mainly does uh, charity work, so I'm very proud of her. It seems like you two have... Um gotten to know each other through the campaign. I mean, you're agreeing on a lot of, <laughs> a lot of issues. So I'm gonna ask um, Larry, what what do you think besides the parties, besides your general philosophies, what do you think separates you from Matt the most? Where, where do you differ, do you think? Well, I, I want to uh, tackle the problems on the low end of, uh, of our economy. Um, I, want to, uh, I want to put $500 a month in uh, in the hands of uh, of every uh, citizen in Washington State, uh, universal basic income. Um, I want to. Uh, uh, I'm definitely leaning towards uh, the the idea of uh, the the whole the whole health. Uh, wa wa the what's it called? The whole wash whole health Washington movement. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, I, you know, I'm a little, little, um, little concerned with how they get there, but, but I do, uh, I do want us to get to a, at least a public option uh, that's strong um, uh, within our state, since it doesn't look like the federal government's going to get there um, anytime soon. So um, uh, I also, you know, I brought up the the housing situation. I want to focus on 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 uh, more opportunities for um, um, lo lower priced housing. Um, also, uh, uh, I I want to make sure uh, that uh, um, that our that our state is uh, well. I, I want to bring some healing if possible between the partisan divide. Um, I mean, Matt brought that up too, but it's kind of hard when you're sitting on one side. Um, and uh, so I, I do, I do want to work with both sides. I want to uh, um, find ways of, uh, um, you know, addressing the racial divide, um, you know, the, the economic class divide, um, you know, go down that list kind of thing, so. Okay, great. All right, Matt, your turn. What do you see um, as the big distinction between you and and Larry? I'd say the biggest is experience with the military background that I have with uh, things bringing to the table. Uh, in addition to, you guys know, I was on the Kennewick City Council, so I know the local issues. Uh, having grown up here, we both have that in parallel, but being on city council gives you a different perspective on 
how the city looks at and needs support from the county and the different layers up to the state. And so now looking at it from the state back down, you can see where those gaps are. And then you can focus on some of those efforts to ensure that the local jurisdictions have the power of what they need. And that's another thing I think we disagree on because I'm not a big government person. I'm not a big state person. I want to empower more of the local jurisdictions to have that power and the power in the individuals to make that decision. Whether it's the sex ed bill on education, whether it's ensuring the populace has the economy, whether it's in the housing market, I believe our state can get out of the way. We can reduce a lot of those heavily burdened government agencies that continues to pop up under the opposition party of the last 20 years or so, and even under uh, our go current governor and the way it continues to empower these agencies to what you see today. And I believe we can start pulling some of that back and people want to change and get more involved and more engaged. And another good thing about COVID is people are engaged, uh, whether they're engaged in the right aspects of doing this, I, I hope, and I, I believe we're going to get a large number of turnout in the voter par participation. So appreciate the help of the media and doing that as well as our local uh, spoke with um, our USPS, as well as other postal workers to make sure our ballots will be out. We'll have everybody voting and more and more are becoming into the Latino community that is so prevalent around here and working with the Tri-City Hispanic Chamber of Commerce to be it out to the businesses that need to be out there and ensure that people of all types, shapes, sizes, colors, that we're all involved and we are all essential in this together. Okay. Is there anybody from the board? I didn't want to keep hogging all the, all the questions. <laughs> so, so okay, Matt. Well, you did mention the sex ed bill, so I'm going to ask you, where was your position on that? And then, Larry, what, how you think you would have voted on that after Matt talks about that? So, and you guys know, I'm still going to use the word freshman. So, uh, as a freshman legislator, this was big eye opening that we're spending so much time on the floor. And that was one of those days that we were on the floor of the house from 8 a.m. till almost 4.30, 5 o'clock the next morning. And most of this was dragging out the timing of when we could actually uh, present the bill. And when the bill was finally presented, the TVW started putting the cross parental guidance uh, disclaimers across the TV set and telling other people across the state that they're not even allowed to watch and see what's going on. You know, I'm big into transparency and accountability we want to make sure we understand that people are involved in this process and they're engaged on what the debate was, what really were the details of the different parts of the bill and actually reading through the bill. And you learn a lot in the first couple of years that you can then leverage and ensure that we're getting deep into the details and understanding what that means about, are we going to have this at K through three, four, five, and six. And we even offered a couple of amendments that the other side didn't even want to discuss. And it meant things like, the don't touch, don't feel, the uh, sexual harassment things that have been going on. We agree with that. A lot of parts of the bill were addressing some of those issues about uh, underage, um, different areas that um, should not be there and they lead to criminal activity that students should know. But at certain levels, they're not mature enough to understand that. And we believe that's why uh, voting no on that bill and having it down again, down to the school board membership to really look at it have our parents board to really review those documents and have our people vote on that and ensure we all know what's going on versus a state level agency that says you will do this. I, I don't mind the, even the opportunity of the opt out clause, but when we read the opt out clause of that bill, it said you will opt out and then you need to send us your documents and everything else that we can then approve. So it was almost like a backhanded compliment that says, yeah, you can opt out, but then we're still gonna have to approve what plan you're gonna use. And that plan still would be something to the effect of what the original sex ed bill that was gonna put in place. There wasn't really any other options out there. And that was another reason I uh, was voting no and still continue to vote no until we can come back to the table and really look at this from a perspective. And, and you know, as well as someone on the board, I'm a teacher, I know what's going on in the teaching profession and the impact that we have on our community. I'm, I'm addressing more of the cyber side of that, but we are still the mentors. The, we raise these kids and we see these children that are coming up through our ranks and we wanna make sure we're doing the best we possibly can with the parents' involvement in our institutions of higher learning to make sure we're gonna do the right thing for our citizens of the state of Washington. 
Okay, Larry, your turn. Did, were you familiar with that? It's a referendum. And yeah, I've, I've read through parts of, of the bill and heard the argument on both sides. Um, I would have voted yes, but um, I was very disappointed about how um, the Democrats did not uh, listen um, as much as they should have to the, the, um, the concerns from the other side and uh, tried to uh, work with them to, to find solutions uh, so that they could get some more of their support. Um, you know, uh, we, we need to be very cautious when we're approaching uh, the, the, uh, the, the uh, venue of, of uh, parents when we're talking about education. So um, while I would have voted yes, it would have been a cautious yes. Okay, any other questions from the board? All righty, well, oh, go ahead. Uh, I was gonna say, Matt, um, you reminded me of this when you were talking about the details and getting down into the nitty gritty. Um, we had a situation where one of our county commissioners, a former state senator, tried to insert into a budget bill a uh, plan to split the Benton Franklin Judicial District. And uh, I'm wondering whether, you, A, Matt, you can enlighten us, and then I'd like to hear both of you uh, give us your thoughts on whether that's a good idea, a bad idea, or what. Well, I appreciate that. I thought it was going to be one of the first ones you guys would have thrown at me today. <laughs> <laughs> you, you remembered it toward the end, so as any good thing. You always keep silent until you know <laughs> ask those questions. So I'm I'm still a freshman, but I'm learning. Um, but I appreciate the question. Yeah, that. Um, so that's where it was a discussion really of when an elected leader from our local jurisdiction, and in this case, you said a county commissioner, comes to us and asks us as a state representative. Again, we represent everybody in the city, everybody in the eighth district, and ensuring what we can do to voice that opinion forward. Uh, I believe there's that opportunities that we can work together to ensure what we see as an issue we need to bring forward, we can and we can address it. Uh, he made his arguments in this case of saying that we need to split it because we're now big enough institutions, big enough counties in this case, to ensure that we can support a system of actually expanding the judicial system in this case of additional uh, positions and how we would move forward. And my original take was, yeah, I agree, but I wanna go ahead and look into that data a little bit more. I went in and took that, reached out to, uh, I think it was Judge Joe Burroughs, uh, a couple of, of uh, his peers on that, and I immediately got uh, really quick and detailed feedback, to say the least, from our local uh, judges, and even some uh, people who were staffing the courts on their opinion on that, and it was a resounding, do not follow up with this. We have a lot more positive about synergy, collaboration that we're doing in our Benton Franklin count, uh, counties that are working together across this. And uh, like anything, I reached across the, the river and asked Franklin County, what would it mean and the impacts of what that would be before making a decision on this, which is why I think I eventually pulled that back. And I said, no, we're gonna, we're, we're gonna look in this even further. And I asked them to go ahead and do that. And that was one of our plans to meet in April when COVID hit. So that's my answer for you, <laughs> but. Okay. Larry. Larry Oh, go ahead. Yeah, Larry, I'd like to know what uh, what your approach on that would be. Well, I I think Matt handled it pretty well. Um, as far as uh, uh, dividing up the judicial uh, between the yeah no, uh, it just doesn't sound right. It's uh, we've had this for many years and it seems to be working. There there is uh, like you said, there's synergy there um, and. Uh, if the people on the ground uh, are are all okay with the way it is, then yeah, I'm not gonna I'm not gonna want to change that at all. So uh, I also want to briefly mention I do uh, I didn't bring out uh, I have a little a small plank on my platform for uh, stimulating local journalism, and um, uh, one thing that uh, we've noticed over the years is uh, local journalism. And especially uh, investigative reporting has been on the decline. Um, a lot of papers have been going out of business. Um, unfortunately, 
you know, you're, you're supported by a very large company that's still somewhat interested in uh, local journalism, but there's a lot of buying up of, of small um, uh, papers and, and, and just letting them rot, really. And so I, I am really concerned about it. And I want to somehow stimulate both private and public partnership in, in uh, uh, lifting up small, young, local papers to get them to a model that is sustainable. Hey, Matt, you said that you were surprised that uh, Ken's question on the judges didn't come up sooner. What other hard questions were you anticipating <laughs> didn't ask? I can always count on you, Jack, for coming through with that. I appreciate that. Um, well, I figured, uh, frankly, uh, Chop Chats, uh, we've uh, picked the last four months. I mean, there's so many things within that, whether it's the unemployment, Chop Chats. I think that was one of the big ones was uh, just the record, my voting record. Uh, a couple of those came out. I think even in the pamphlets, people have already acknowledged I'm a little bit different than some of the other uh, predecessors who have been out there and how my leadership style, I, I think, is really trying to pull people together. But to some people on the far right and the far left, they disagree. Um, they see some uh, issues with that. So uh, I don't know. I think I was going to get more of the, uh, you know, Black Lives Matter, Chop Chaz, those kind of questions from me as well. Or taxes. You know, those are always fun. <laughs> so, well, we're kind of winding down. Um, I was going to give the candidates a chance to ask each other a question if you wanted to. Um, sometimes the candidates have issues that we aren't even aware of that they want to get out there. So, um, Larry, do you have a question for Matt at all? No, no. Nope, that's okay. You can decline. That's fine. That's fine. <laughs> Did you have a question for Larry then, Matt, at all? I, I would just ask him like anything, because I always appreciate anybody getting to this arena and actually running for office. And it means a lot that more people stay engaged and run. Uh, looking at his background, like anybody does, you look on social media and things, everybody says nice things about Larry and, and can't do, you know, say anything but nice stuff about him. Uh, and again, just appreciate him staying out or uh, if he happens to not win the race, is he going to stay engaged in the community? What are his plans, I guess, for after the election would be my question. Um, if if I, uh, if I uh, don't win, I do want to stay engaged. I do want to stay, uh, um, I want to uh, maybe find a way on a, on a couple of committees, uh, municipal, uh, you know, in a municipality. Um, I uh, probably will run for Richland City Council again. Um, so there's, there are some, I, I definitely have a little bit of uh, interest, a little bit of ambition in that regard. Um, so I, I want to, and I want to keep trying to grow this uh, fledgling uh, party so that uh, we do provide a, a, an option. Um, and uh, yeah, so that's, 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 that's pretty much, uh, that's pretty much it. Um, thank you, Matt, for, for your kind words. And uh, I do know why the Democrats didn't want to put up anybody against you because you, 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 um, around the community, you do have quite a stellar reputation, so. No, I appreciate that, it means a lot. I and appreciate I, your I... service so far. <laughs> and, 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 and to be honest, if I was uh, so fortunate to win, um, I would, your, your uh, I think it's just your one bill that you put forward uh, about the Space Force uh, Academy, uh, search, trying to gra uh, bring attention to that. And bring it here. Uh, I will be all for it. I will. I will still advocate for it uh, in your stead. I appreciate that. No, <laughs> I, I appreciate you staying engaged as well, and and keeping this community strong. And I believe that's one big thing that we got to come out of COVID is is staying engaged and keeping up that good work. So I appreciate that. Thanks for the kind words as well. So unless there's any other questions, we can just go with the closing. Are you you know the closing uh, comments? Um, I let Matt go first. So Larry, I'll let you go first on your quote. Okay. Well, um, 
thank you again for Tri City Herald for this opportunity uh, the, to uh, come before you and answer your questions and and uh, have uh, a good discussion uh, about the issues. Um, again, my my heart is for service. I want I want uh, the best for our community, and um, and I think that uh, um, I bring a lot of experiences both internationally and uh, and uh, interdisciplinary uh, wise. I bring a lot of different. Um, um, skills and talents to the job. Um, and I will definitely seek out both the experts and the uh, uh, of each each issue and our, uh, and listen to the citizens. Um, that's critical. I think we always the, the pol politicians go in mostly, I think being honest and wanting to listen and they get there and they uh, rarely do because so much is about fundraising. Um, but I truly do want to focus on that. And I, I pledge I will do very minimal fundraising when it comes to uh, 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 being in that position. Um, I know there has to be some, but uh, uh, we must listen to our, our, uh, our people. And, um, and I, and I, um, and I and I want I truly do want to focus on uh, on on uh, healing our uh, divides the things that divide us especially the last four years um, it's it's uh, it's totally un-American what has been happening so I, I want the the this community to be a beacon a light um, we shouldn't uh, uh, we shouldn't have the strife that we do have. Thank you. All right, Matt, whenever you're ready. Okay, thanks. Uh, thank you guys for having us today and doing this and, and the uh, questions that you can obviously tell you guys are well read uh, and understand the issues better than most. Uh, and so I ask humbly for your endorsement uh, today. And this endorsement is for an experienced leader that you know of that came from the Mighty Eighth, that uh, leads the Mighty Eighth and then tried to bring people back together uh, one thing we didn't focus on is leading efforts like the Tri-City Civic Caucus that I'm a part of, which is a bipartisan effort locally between Democrats of all different sides, Republicans of all different sides, coming together to, I think, help what we discussed. And that's, I believe, America's at a crossroads. It's where we look back in history and we're going to see this time to where we're going to understand this is our second tower moment people are asking for that's waking up our uh, country. COVID-19 has impacted our lives and there's a lot of important issues that are facing us that we need to take very seriously. And they're impacting our economy, our education and the energy sector that we know and live with. But we gotta remember we're still Americans in all this. We are all essential. We are all in this time of crisis together and we need experience now uh, leadership more than ever. Uh, we need to bring back the fundamental core values that were taught by my parents and my grandparents and those values of military service that we are here to serve others, uh, to find common ground, to ask the tough questions, to stand up, to look people in the eye and say, yes, sir, no, ma'am, and to do it together and to find those solutions in Olympia or any place around the world. We need to be the bright future that we are and have been. And America is a great country. Washington is still a great state. No matter what you read or hear about on Facebook and social media, we have so many great things going for us. And then we need to look at that and showcase the hashtag Mighty Eight District the best it can be. We need leaders who have that vision, and I'm one of those, to make the right decisions to help us realize that bright future together. So again, thank you for your time, and thank you, Larry, for being a part of this. That was perfect. Thank you. Thank you, gentlemen. It was a pleasure. This was a nice one. <laughs> it was really great. It was, it was great. Thank you very much.